Our third speaker is Chris Udry from the University of, uh, of, of Yale. Um, Chris is an economist, um, originally started his work uh, on credit in, in northern Nigeria. He's also worked heavily in northern Ghana, and he's written very extensively about the economics of African agricultural development, particularly within a West African uh, context. Chris. Yes, so I think I actually know nothing about anywhere but West Africa, so <laughs> hopefully we'll be able to generalize. Um, so I took your email seriously, as Agnes did. Um, you, you asked, why do we see slow yield and output per worker growth in agriculture in Africa? I added profits, since I'm a, as economists we have to be obsessed with profits. Um, but it's true as well that we're just not seeing growth in productivity in agriculture in Africa. You gave us four reasons that we might want to consider. Difficult physical conditions and lack of appropriate technology, lack of incentives to invest and innovate, too little public investment in roads and infrastructure, and bad markets and institutions. Um, and so I, I, typically one, one would say now is yes, all of those matter. And I think that's true, all, all of those matter. Um, but in fact, really, when you the, for the big overview, the, 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 what I think is really the right answer, is it's the lack of appropriate technology. It's the lack of good technology that uh, generates big profits for farmers in Africa. And, and why do I think that's true? Why do I think that there's just very strong evidence that that's true? Because when such opportunities exist, when large-scale profits can be made, farmers in Africa find a way to adopt them. Um, and so, so the easiest example, my favorite example, you know, given where I grew up in Africa, I mean, you know, intellectually, is uh, the, the growth of cocoa in 20th century Ghana. So everybody here knows the story. I don't even really need to repeat it. But I just want to point out a couple of things. This happened in the early 20th century in Ghana when markets were highly imperfect, financial markets were disastrously imperfect, labor markets were poor, output markets didn't exist when it started. Um, and so the, the, the environment was not conducive at all. Um, property rights were as ambiguous as they are now. Um, and this, moreover, was a very long-term, highly risky investment. You couldn't eat it. Um, it took years. It involved huge fixed costs. Um, huge fixed costs in multiple dimensions. It involved migration, restructuring <coughs> families, creating new towns, clearing forests. Um, and yet, we saw very rapid adoption and enormous profits being generated um, from this. Now, that's the most extreme and, and uh, uh, the best example from my point of view that I can think of. But there are many, many other examples. Um, I've worked with in Aquapim in Ghana with pineapple farmers where we saw similar things happening, Burkina Faso and Mali cotton growers, Malawi potato growers. Over and over again we see that when there are opportunities, farmers will overcome obstacles including disastrous roads, bad infrastructure, bad uh, institutions. Um, so we should all go away and just make sure that the scientists are at work um, developing new technologies. I think there's been vast underinvestment for decades, for centuries, in new technologies for agriculture in Africa. And we've got this long-term deficit of technological innovation that needs to be made up. And that's the most important thing that can be done. Okay. All right, so, so fine. That's, but we can't just sit around waiting for the, 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 the brilliant new crop to appear from some scientist somewhere. I mean, we, we've got to be supporting them. But in the meantime, there are, in fact, other innovations that, that could make farmers better off. Um, and there's going to be marginal things that come up year after year. In fact, a good agricultural research system is going to be generating slight improvements every year to new seeds or new techniques or new machines. Um, and for these more marginal improvements, these other imperfections, I think, matter a lot. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is, so now I'm going to switch into sales mode. This is the focus of a research initiative that I'm part of um, and that I feel justified in talking about in this context because its funders are uh, DFID and, and the Gates Foundation. So there's a big 
British component to this. It's ATI stands for the Agricultural Technology Adoption Initiative, and it's based um, at uh, the Poverty Action Lab at MIT and SEGA at Berkeley. And this research uses RCTs. We'll talk about RCTs some more. Maybe we can find a disagreement. <laughs> um, um, to evaluate and understand interventions that are designed to overcome specific obstacles to the adoption of new technology, that there's prima facie evidence is good stuff for farmers. And so, for example, maybe trying to understand why farmers aren't using more fertilizer, why small-scale irrigation projects aren't being uh, generated in local communities. So specific technologies that appear to be profitable and yet aren't being adopted at a wide scale. Uh, so w this research is designed to try to figure out why not. And it's organized around, since it's run by economists, it's organized around potential market failures. And so if you go to farmers and you ask them why they're not using more fertilizer, um, there's one answer that I get all the time. I, I presume you guys all get the mm -hmm. same answer, which is? What's too costly. We don't have money. Oh, we don't have money. Mm -hmm. we don't, exactly. It's too costly. We don't have money. Um, if I had money, I'd use a lot more fertilizer. So maybe imperfect credit markets is a, or, or financial markets are an Im important constraint to the adoption of certain types of technology. Another response I often get is it's too risky. If it doesn't rain, I've made this investment, I lose the whole, the, the whole investment I've made. And so imperfect risk markets is another set of potential issues that might be a barrier to the adoption of new technology. Sometimes it's information. Farmers don't know about new technologies um, or don't know how to use them as well as they could. Um, and hence, maybe when they try them, it doesn't work out because they're not doing it quite right and they're abandoned. There's externalities the, the, for a lot of environmental, for the medium scale interventions that might be organized locally. It's, you have to figure out how, what's the incentives that farmers have in order to um, make investments when those investments yield returns for their neighbors as well as for themselves, uh, like preserving forests, um, terracing. Um, failures in the input and output markets. We know that the prices of inputs are extraordinarily high across much of Africa, and the, co the price of outputs is extraordinarily low due to bad infrastructure, and market imperfections, like uh, tr try if, we, if we look for new improved varieties uh, with maybe lots of vitamin A, um, it may be difficult to develop output markets that reward farmers for that, um, or for, for seed systems, same, similar problems. Um, labor markets, don't get me started on labor markets in West Africa. It's, it's, it's hard to think about how you generate the flows of labor from, from one household to another or one community to another and, and, and how those are organized. Um, our, our device is about to turn off automatically in 56 seconds. <laughs> Just thought I'd let you know. <laughs> um, um, and so I guess it's just that one. Yeah, um, yeah don't, okay. don't, don't worry. And land markets, um, property rights, and, and, and trying to understand all of those. So there's a whole set of, of research that DFID is helping fund to try to understand, in particular areas, which of these constraints are, are binding for the adoption of which technologies. So um, it'd be fun to talk about all of them. Uh, there are 32 projects funded so far as, as as, as part of this. But there's lots of other research going on uh, around the world that, are, that is motivated by similar questions because it's something we face every day when, when we're in the field. So let me give you just one example of one area where there's been a lot of research. Um, and and I, I, I won't go into any detail, but risk. So farmers not adopting new technologies because it's risky. Um, there have been six projects funded by DFID and Gates through ATI to look at this, but there's lots of work, or, you know, lo lots of people uh, in this room have thought about risk and how it influences farmer decision making. So the, the conclusion from looking at that literature is, duh, yes, risk matters. Farmers have to deal with a very uncertain environment. There's virtually no irrigation. And so they're dealing with rainfall risk, for example, and it's a big deal. And 
uh, it seems to affect people's investment. And so one reason we know that is through randomized controlled trials in which certain farmers are given access to improved insurance markets, in particular weather index insurance um, markets, which is uh, an interesting thing we could talk about. Um, when farmers get access to that, they invest more in agriculture, and they invest more in riskier, higher return agriculture. And so we see risk, uh, imperfect insurance against risk mattering for farmer adoption of new technology, like intensified use of fertilizer. No problem. We're going to make it. Um, so we've seen th there's a set of studies. Um, but at the same time, insurance improvements in insurance markets turn out to be really difficult to make happen. It's really costly. We've got decades of experience of complete failures of yield or crop insurance um, models where we, we try to insure farmers for their output and they're just subject to disastrous enforcement problems and moral hazard problems and adverse selection problems and huge costs of monitoring. Um, but s and, and it was to get around those costs that rainfall index insurance was developed. It's basically insurance that says if it doesn't rain, which we can observe from satellites or from rainfall stations, if it doesn't rain, we'll give you an insurance payout. Um, even that is very costly to reach farmers because farmers, the value of their crops is low relative to the transaction cost of reaching the farmers. And so it's, again, we're, we're back in this world of small transactions that have a large fixed cost. And it's very difficult to keep the price low enough to have farmers demand insurance at commercial rates. We need to find a way to reduce transactions costs. Um, and then there are other more fundamental economic problems with insurance markets. Um, like the fact that why should a farmer believe me when I tell you, tell them that when it doesn't rain, I'll give you money? Um, you know, what's, what, how do we build trust? How, how, do we, how, do, how, does it, how does a farmer begin to believe that that would be true, that I'd make that payment? And, and in fact, how can we make it so that payment is made? How do you set up an ins institution such that these insurance contracts aren't reneged upon? Um, there's a more technical problem called basis risk, which is the fact that whether, whether it rains or not at a rainfall station may not be very relevant to a farmer um, out 10 kilometers away. It might rain differently on his or her farm, and, be, and he, he or she faces other risks th that the rainfall, isn't gonna, rainfall insurance isn't going to cover. Um, and so uh, there's been more recent work looking at risk mitigating crop improvements that look very promising. Submergent tolerant or drought resistant varieties of crops have been extremely promising in India and in Sierra Leone, Narika in Sierra Leone. Okay. If we look across those studies that I mentioned there and across all the program areas of this agricultural technology adoption initiative, I think the fundamental lesson we learn is um, that for these marginal improvements, these things that might make farmers 5 or 10 percent better off, heterogeneity in the constraints and opportunities is fundamental. So here's where both Ruth and Agnes said, we're all saying exactly the same thing. The, lo the location specificity is fundamental for agriculture, obviously. I mean, it's just that something that works in one place is not necessarily going to work in another place. M more interestingly, the, there's enormous variation in to over time in the returns depending upon local conditions, rainfall, pests, prices. And so over time, whether something is a good idea or not changes. And then here's where you know, maybe the results we have and the results you have from your study, Agnes, are different. I find enormous variation within small communities in opportunities and constraints. Some farmers in small villages in Mali having enormous returns to investment in fertilizer, others having zero returns. And, and them being indistinguishable to me um, based on pretty rich data that we have. So it's hard to figure out the source of the heterogeneity. And so my final point is that I think that like Agnes said, um, and as Ruth said, actually as Ruth said, but you, you, you're you definitely going to agree with this, don't search for simple solutions. Get past social engineering, embrace that heterogeneity, 
Um, I'm turning into a right-wing crank as I get old. The <laughs> markets do that. It allows people to voluntarily select into to things, but also decentralization and, and, and more organic solutions rather than top-down solutions that are, that are uniform um, make sense. So it's also Jim Scott and seeing like a state uh, mm -hmm. reemerges um, as, as well as Chicago price theory. Okay, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. And thanks for, for, for shaping your talk. Um, somewhat miraculously to fit in with what Agnes and, and Ruth <laughs> It's nothing miraculous, but we read each other. <laughs> <laughs>